Good evening, and thank you to everyone for joining us for our second Teletown Hall. Whether you're joining us for the first time or coming back after last week's discussion, welcome. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve by the hour, and my priority is making sure that you and your families have the information and support that you need to stay healthy and safe. My office has been assisting constituents day and night getting connected with resources they need to stay on their feet. We've been working with the FDA and the Health and Human Services to advance potentially game-changing technology to improve COVID-19 testing. We've been advancing local production of personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE. We've been, even been able to help get some constituents home who had been stranded abroad. So please, don't hesitate to call us. We are living through unprecedented times. We must remain mindful that every single one of us has an urgent responsibility to lessen the impact of this crisis. All of the small and perhaps uncomfortable life adjustments we've been asked to make, social distancing, washing our hands all too frequently, disinfecting surfaces regularly, and frankly, just staying home, it all helps flatten the curve. It ensures that our healthcare workers can meet the surge of patients and it ultimately saves lives. We can and we will get through this together. As we continue to confront the health component of this crisis, everything we do as leaders and as citizens should continue to give assurance to workers that their jobs will be secure and that we won't let our small businesses fail. And that for as long as our lives are disrupted, we will be there for each other. In moments of great need, we rally together and we put the greater good above all else. It's who we are as Americans. We see what happens when our leaders resort to pettiness or prejudice or knee-jerk tendencies toward blaming others. Our neighbors get hurt, a regrettable reality for our Asian American community right now. Please remember, xenophobia only harms us and it's incumbent on all of us to stand strong and uphold our values. Like you, I've made a lot of changes at home and at work. My two daughters are home from public elementary school until at least May 4th. My husband and I are competing for a home office space, which all represent, it all presents you know, challenges on its own. My mom, who I've come to rely on for help with my girls, she's been at home with my dad, who has MS, for the last two weeks. We've had to cease physical contact, relying only on FaceTime. Tonight, I plan on taking safety precautions by driving down to Washington, D.C., rather than flying to vote on the third emergency funding package. And I've transitioned my staff here in Massachusetts and in Washington over to telework procedures so that we can adhere to social distance protocols and mitigate virus spread. No effort is too small or too big, especially when we are discussing taking care of our healthcare workers. They are on the front lines working around the clock to save lives, all too often lacking the protective equipment they need to keep themselves and their families safe. The wealthiest country on earth should be more than capable of providing masks, tests, and ventilators to our nation's hospitals, clinics, and community health centers. An effective response to this pandemic requires a wartime footing, and that means invoking the Defense Production Act. In the absence of our administration executing this act, our office is actively soliciting information from manufacturers in the district with excess capacity that want to repurpose their facilities for producing PPE. Additionally, I co-sponsored legislation to force the issue at scale. The Medical Supply Chain Emergency Act takes over the federal supply chain for protective equipment and ensures that healthcare providers and first responders have what they need to keep themselves and their families safe. Earlier this week, I also joined with Congressman Ro Khanna from California and other colleagues to call on President Trump to institute a mandatory national two-week stay-at-home order. It is the most effective thing we can do to protect people and mitigate long-term economic damage. In the meantime, Congress is working diligently to get working people and small businesses the assistance that they need to survive. On March 6th, President Trump signed Congress's first emergency supplemental package to the tune of $8.3 billion. 
that consisted of entirely new funds and included support for state and local health agencies, vaccine and treatment development, and loans for affected small businesses to lessen the economic blow of this public health emergency. Money from this package is now starting to work its way into our communities. Two weeks ago, Congress took decisive action once more when we passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which provides emergency paid leave, establishes free coronavirus testing, supports expanded unemployment benefits, ensures food assistance for vulnerable children and families while they're home from school, protects frontline health workers, and provides additional funding to states for the ongoing economic consequences of the pandemic. The president signed that package into law last week. And finally, of course, within the next 24 hours, I'll be voting with my colleagues in the House to pass a critical $2 trillion coronavirus aid, relief, and economic security package. Like any legislation of this size, the CARES Act isn't perfect, but it's a necessary, robust, and urgent response to the pain and anxiety that workers, families, and small businesses are feeling right now. This package will send direct cash payments to more than 150 million American households. It will set up substantial loan programs for businesses to help them survive this downturn. It will pump billions of dollars into unemployment insurance programs to meet the unprecedented increase in unemployment. It will greatly boost spending on hospitals. They will have their own Marshall Plan. It'll expand financial assistance to state and local governments to make sure they're able to continue their own response to this pandemic. And it will expand funding for child care services and community health care centers, two priorities of mine. This legislation is important, but we all have a duty as members of our community to keep ourselves and our families safe and healthy, especially our seniors and our immune vulnerable. Here on this call to lend their expertise, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Zandra Kelly, the Chief Medical Officer at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. Mr. Bob Nelson, the District Director of the Small Business Administration's Massachusetts office, and Dr. Eric W. Dixon, President and CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare. I'd like to thank you all again for joining us tonight, and we'll turn it over to our experts who can give a little more insight into the virus and our response. Let's start with some brief introductions. Up first, Dr. Zandra Kelly, Chief Medical Officer for the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. Welcome. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Trahan, and thank you for bringing us together to speak today about the coronavirus. Um, so my name is Zandra Kelly, and I'm a phys family physician by training. Um, my medical degree is from the U University of Chicago, and my residency training was at the Lawrence Family Medicine Residency here at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, where I'm currently the chief medical officer and a faculty member for our family medicine residency program. Our health center sees all patients, including children, adults, pregnant patients, and the elderly. We are located in Lawrence, Massachusetts, about 30 miles north of Boston. We serve around 60,000 patients, and our staff provide both office and hospital care. We have more than 60 physicians, around 20 uh, nurse practitioner PAs, and around 40 resident physicians in training. I'm honored to be a part of this tele-town hall and look forward to answering your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. The Greater Lawrence Family Health Center is doing such incredible work for so many in our community. Next, we have Mr. Bob Nelson, uh, District Director of the Small Business Administration here in Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman uh, Tran, for your leadership and for inviting me to be part of today's call and to share information with everyone about the SBA and our programs and services. Uh, for a little background on me, I started off as a, uh, a banker a long time ago, but it, for the past 29 years, I've been with the federal government. I started off with the FDIC during the banking crisis in New England in the early 1990s uh, when banks were failing left and right here in New England. But uh, for the past 21 years, I've worked for the SBA, 11 years of which I've been the state director and responsible for the effective delivery of SBA's programs and services across the Commonwealth. I'm uh, proud to be part of the SBA, and I uh, absolutely believe that I have one of the best and most productive SBA offices in the entire country. 
Uh, each year, with the help of our lenders and our partners, we do roughly $700 million in capital support to uh, Massachusetts small businesses, and that's Massachusetts alone. And we counsel and train uh, thousands of small businesses so that they can be successful. And the SBA also plays a critical role uh, with government contracting and helping to make sure that small businesses get their fair share of government contracts. And lastly, why we're all here today, uh, the SBA is the agency that's charged with helping small businesses to recover from disasters. I can tell you that this disaster is unlike anything I've ever experienced in my career and nothing that I ever would have imagined. Uh, I thank you again, and I look forward to hearing the questions and providing the best guidance that I have available. Thank you, Congresswoman. Which makes your contribution to this session tonight so valuable. Thank you, Bob. And at last, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Eric Dixon, President and CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare. Thank you, Congresswomen, and uh, thank you all for being on the call today. Uh, my name is Eric Dixon. I am a uh, emergency physician uh, who's also trained by the U.S. Army as a respiratory therapist to run uh, ventilator machines that you're hearing uh, so much about, and uh, a proud graduate of the state's only public medical school, uh, UMass. I now serve also as the CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare located in Worcester, Lemonster, Fitchburg, Marlboro, Clinton, and many of the other towns in and around uh, central Massachusetts. I just want to say thank you to everyone out there for the sacrifices that you are making by keep, keeping your distance and social distancing, uh, cutting down on your social activities and not gathering in large groups, being relentless about hand hygiene and disinfecting because what you're doing right now is helping us save lives and by keeping the burden of disease in this state down to a manageable level such that the healthcare system can keep up. So thank you for all that you're doing and thank you for having me on the call. Great, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those introductions and without further delay, let's get right into the questions. Now we've received hundreds of questions through uh, our submission portal and we did our best to select questions that were widely reflective of your concerns, and we'll continue to do our best to answer all the remaining questions we can uh, following this call. Uh, but Dr. Dixon, the first question is for you. It's from Polly R. in Concord. She asks, what is the state of COVID-19 testing and medical personnel protection in our district? Those are probably two of the most important topics related to the, the treatment and the identification of patients with uh, coronavirus disease. Uh, right now, testing is still uh, limited. We are only testing individuals that are sick enough to be in the hospital and individuals that are working in healthcare situations, including first responders, police, fire, EMS. Uh, and those that work in nursing homes because they play such a vital role in the healthcare system in preventing the spread of this disease over, overall. The test turnaround time is in the range of 24 hours uh, uh, now in the region, and what we really need is a point-of-care test that can turn around in 45 minutes. We believe that's coming, and, but that probably won't have that at least for another month. That would allow us to test much more broadly in the, in the population and identify who is potentially carrying this disease and spreading this disease. So uh, testing is a very, very important topic and we'll hopefully we'll continue to make progress on that. The lack of testing then lends to use of personal protective equipment, PPE, on patients that you suspect have the disease and you're waiting for the test to turn around. So early on, uh, every patient with respiratory symptoms had to be put on precautions, and we had to use our personal protective equipment and use it up because we didn't have a test that would come back fast enough to, to remove that patient from the isolation precautions. So our supply of PPE in this region is dwindled. Um, we, uh, we hear that we're uh, hopefully going to get a release um, from the federal government of some stores. We have not received that yet. Um, and we're probably uh, living off about a week's supply right now and working every day, <clears throat> probably on this more than anything else right now, to get the equipment in that our caregivers need to keep our patients and 
uh, to keep themselves safe. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Dr. Kelly, you may be best suited to answer our next question from Tom R. He asks, what does this crisis tell us about the gaps in our public health and information resources? Uh, great. Thank you so much for that excellent question. Um, first, to start a little bit with um, controlling a pandemic such as this, um, it's best begun when the number of, of infected individuals is low. So early on, one of the keys, um, as Dr. Dixon was just saying, is to be able to test, and then we could track those patients who were infected. Um, and this would allow us to educate on how to isolate um, and further track uh, the contacts of that person so that we could ask them to quarantine themselves. And unfortunately, this was a gap. It did not happen uh, in our country because we were unable to do those tests. So we did not know who had the disease and who did not. Um, we knew that coronavirus was in our midst though because of the symptoms our patients were presenting with, um, but we were not able to um, test them to know. And so a, a lot of these patients went home from our outpatient clinic sites with instructions about how to isolate themselves to try to help them to not pass it to others. Um, but isolation for many people is very difficult, especially in homes where people may have many people living together in a small space and they don't have any spare rooms um, to serve as isolation rooms at home. And it's extremely difficult for people who may be homeless, staying with a friend or living in a shelter. And these are some of the situations that we're facing in our community is how can we help to curb the spread um, when we don't really have um, adequate space for the people in our community to be able to isolate themselves and practice what we are um, encouraging them to do. So um, because we're unable to test people, we did miss that first phase of actually tracking people's contacts and having them uh, stay home. So now we're into this second phase, which we call community spread, as everyone's heard about. And that's um, when the individuals are uh, sick, but we have no idea who they came into contact with that infected them. They don't know who they got it from, and we don't either. So last week at our clinic sites, um, we started seeing up to 80 patients a day with respiratory symptoms. Um, I'm sure they didn't all have coronavirus, but I'm sure many of them did. Um, and so with not being able to test, of course, they went home um, with instructions. Um, and I'm just learning today that we have a number of seriously ill patients requiring a ventilator at our local hospital, which was zero on Monday, and today is at 11. Um, so it's increasing um, very quickly. Uh, we started to be able to send out these tests last week um, around Wednesday for our outpatients. And uh, unfortunately, these tests took five to six days to be completed um, and result, which means we didn't get the results until around Monday or Tuesday. So this was, um, as Dr. Dixon said, a huge gap um, in our ability to respond. We have gotten some tests that turn around a little bit more quickly now, so we're getting more positive tests. Um, one of the other things that we were kind of unprepared for was um, right now we really need to not have patients come into the clinics for face-to-face -face visits um, because we are trying to keep people from congregating together. But very few offices were doing what we call telehealth until last week. Um, so since last Monday, we have put an extraordinary effort towards converting almost all of our visits into telephone or video-enabled visits so that patients can stay home and not be exposed to other patients who may be presenting with illness at our clinic sites. Um, and many of the other offices in the area are doing the same thing, and you probably are seeing that in your area as well. Um, I just, I think another gap just across the whole country is our broader system of healthcare was not um, prepared or didn't have any reserves in place for a surge of illness like this. So I'm sure you've all heard about the um, shortage in PPE or personal protective equipment, which continues to be an extremely um, concerning reality for those working on the front lines. Um, and we don't have uh, backup medical personnel or sufficient backup equipment for a crisis like this one. So to summarize, I think one of the gaps was our lack of ability to test, as we've talked about. Um, another one was that we weren't really ahead of the game in terms of education or putting together some housing options to help people to isolate themselves. 
Um, thirdly, we didn't have a system in place um, for any virtual visits of healthcare system. Um, and I think the last thing is just an overall broader uh, sense of not having the capacity or the backup to be able to handle a large volume of ill citizens like this. Um, but if we can do what's called flattening the curve, that will space out the number of people who are seriously ill um, and not have uh, a huge spike. And that will be accomplished by people being able to stay at home. Um, and so uh, I think the medical community is really increasing our capacity. We're learning quickly and we're adjusting as fast as we can. So with the help of you and the, all the communities, understanding to stay home and keep themselves healthy, uh, we can get through this together. Well, thank you, Dr. Kelly. It is in large part why we do this, um, so that everyone is empowered on how we can uh, delay uh, that surge. And I imagine there will be many, many more lessons to ring out uh, when the time comes uh, on, so that you know, we put proper uh, health care and public policy uh, in place for for any uh, other you know, future crisis. I'll switch gears now. This, this next question is one that I get uh, from, small from the small business community. Uh, so it's great to have you on the line, Bob. Eric S. wants to know, what is the status of assistance for small businesses today? Great, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, the SBA worked very closely with the governor's office, the Mass Office of uh, Housing and Economic Development, MEMA, and uh, we were able to get a, a quick application into the SBA for a disaster declaration in Massachusetts. And uh, we got a declaration last Wednesday, the 18th. Uh, Massachusetts was one of the uh, early states to get a full statewide declaration. And what that did is it made uh, economic injury disaster loans available to small business in nonprofits. Uh, these are direct loans from the SBA. Uh, these are not processed through our lending partners like our normal uh, loan program. Uh, so direct loans from the SBA, uh, small businesses and private nonprofits would apply by going on to uh, SBA's disaster loan uh, portal, which is sba.gov slash disaster. Uh, these loans are up to $2 million. The interest rate is 3.75% for small businesses fixed uh, for the life of the loan with terms of up to 30 years. For private nonprofits, the interest rate is 2.75%, again, fixed for the life of the loan uh, with terms up to, two, up to two years. The proceeds of these loans are for working capital purposes so that businesses have some uh, capital so that they can pay bills that they otherwise would have been able to pay with cash flow had the disaster not occurred. So think of uh, rent payments, uh, debt service payments, payroll, uh, utilities, any of the normal working capital needs that a business would have, the uh, economic injury loan proceeds could be used to meet those obligations. Uh, one of the recent changes that SBA made um, uh, within just a couple days, which I think is really significant, is um, we've, we're now uh, implementing an immediate 12-month deferment on those loans. I know small businesses are concerned about taking on new debt at this time of uncertainty, so at least we're uh, reducing some stress on their part with them knowing that they're not going to have to make payments on the SBA's uh, economic injury loan uh, for a full 12 months. Uh, one of the other things that we've done is, and we're continuing to tweak the process as uh, days go on, and I continue to learn new things daily. Uh, we know that it is critical to get uh, capital into the hands of small businesses yesterday. Uh, it, you know, for the past uh, week and a half, two weeks, uh, our our phone calls and emails have been off the hook uh, with small businesses looking for information and guidance on how to access uh, the economic injury loan program, how it works, uh, what are the what are the terms, who's eligible. So I can tell you that you know small businesses, 
we're encouraging you to apply. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about the stimulus bill that is about to be signed. Uh, there's certainly a lot of money in that bill for the SBA, and uh, there will be new programs. But at this point in time, what we're suggesting that all small businesses do is apply for the economic injury disaster loan uh, through the SBA uh, disaster website. Uh, these uh, the, the funds on these loans are a critical lifeline to help small businesses to survive and recover. This is the work that SBA does. Uh, you know, when you think of floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, you know, this is the the, the mandate of the SBA uh, to help. Uh, you know, small businesses to recover. And so, again, uh, that's just one of the the tools that we currently have. We we did introduce and push out to our lending partners a, a new uh, program that has become available. It's called an express bridge loan. Uh, so an express bridge loan would be processed through our lending partners. It's a loan of up to $25,000. It's not a lot of money. But uh, under the Express Bridge Loan pro uh, Program, we provide a guarantee to the bank in order to help them get comfortable and to say yes. Uh, with the SBA Economic Injury Loan Program, it is a process. Uh, we have been given guidance that it could take up to 21 days for a decision by the SBA. But I can tell you, you know, we've had a declaration for uh, just a little bit more than a week. Uh, there have been uh, approvals uh, all across New England. So uh, applications certainly are going through quicker than 21 days, but that's the guidance that we're telling folks. And it could take another five to seven days uh, for closing and funding on that loan. So the Express Bridge Loan is a tool uh, that a small business can work with their existing lender, uh, their existing SBA Express lender, uh, to get some uh, immediate cash uh, so that they can uh, make uh, some payments on their obligations and to provide them with some capital. And uh, the in most instances, the uh, express bridge loan would be paid off with the uh, economic injury loan once that is approved and funded. The other thing that we've been doing, we, we have such a strong network of lenders here in the Commonwealth each year. About 135 different lenders use our program. Uh, we've been talking to our lenders about providing payment deferments uh, on existing SBA uh, borrowers. Uh, we do a lot of SBA loans, as you heard me mention earlier. Uh, so for borrowers out there, uh, you know our lenders are processing deferments. Uh, these can be anywhere from three months up to six months. Uh, so it's another uh, way that we're trying to reduce the stress and the immediate concerns of uh, having to make uh, debt payments on your existing SBA loans. The other thing that the SBA administrator announced is that uh, for existing SBA disaster loan borrowers, uh, their their payments are uh, automatically deferred through 1231 of this year. But the, the other thing that I, I just want to stress is that the SBA, we have an incredible partner network uh, with the Small Business Development Centers, our SCORE organization, the Center for Women and Enterprise. Uh, these are folks, everyone is working remotely, but they're accessible, uh, and they have all been trained on the SBA Economic Injury Loan Program. We're going to continue to train our partners uh, as new programs are released uh, so that they can work directly with the small business community all across the Commonwealth. But, uh, you know, definitely if, you, if you're uh, wondering how to access lo local resources, what I would suggest that uh, businesses do is go on to the SBA Massachusetts website, which is sba.gov slash MA. Uh, you can see a button to uh, search for local resources. You'll also see a button to sign up for uh -huh. our uh, email uh, blast. I would encourage everyone to sign up for our email Last, this is one of the uh, major ways that we're going to con continue to communicate with the entire community to let them know about the most recent uh, uh, programs and services and accurate and current information. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. And I'm looking forward to voting uh, tomorrow so that uh, we can unleash the help that we know is in this, uh, this next package. So more is on the way. Uh, I'm going to take this next question. It's from Hank M. in Marlboro. 
Uh, and he asks, how is the federal government working with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to supplement our healthcare system and emergency response? So Hank, this is an all hands on deck problem and we all need to be all in to solve it. That means working closely with state, regional and local agencies. You know, since day one, we've been in constant communication uh, with Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters, uh, with agencies like uh, SBA's Massachusetts District Office and certainly our state and local officials. Our congressional delegation has been ringing the alarms on behalf of the Commonwealth. Uh, not just to the, the administration, but to all federal agencies. To the Health and Human Services Secretary Azar, we demanded an update on the status of Massachusetts' request for personal protective equipment from the strategic national stockpile. Uh, to the White House Coronavirus Task Force, we called for evaluation of funding needs at state and local public health facilities. We requested supplemental funding as necessary and greater access to testing kits and certainly encourage wraparound services for coronavirus patients moving forward. We are also in close coordination with our local hospitals and our VA system. This virus has left no one untouched and the fight will take all of us. You know, as I mentioned, the phase three package is approaching the finish line. This is the biggest economic relief package in modern history. It's bigger than the 2008 economic relief package of $700 billion. It essentially injects $2 trillion in assistance to workers, families, and businesses during this pandemic. It's new money on top of what's already been funded to help uh, strained state and local governments. Some of our biggest priorities in that package include billions in direct cash payments of 1,200 or more per household, $350 billion in loans and grants to small businesses, $150 billion to help state and local response and prevention efforts, over $100 billion to help stabilize hospitals and community health centers and to cover unreimbursed health care expenses, along with ma a massive temporary expansion of unemployment benefits. Look, I know that some like to focus on the stock market, but I would urge everyone to focus your attention on the health crisis, on the health crisis First and foremost, <clears throat> we need people to be well. It's the only path to restoring confidence and breathing life back into the economy. Think about it. People are home. They're unemployed. There's no demand. And frankly, there's very limited supply. These, these are unprecedented dynamics. Um, and they'll, you know, <laughs> they'll continue if we don't focus on securing our public health. We do that by strengthening our healthcare system, our emergency response, and protecting our healthcare workers. Okay, let's get back to the experts. Dr. Kelly, our next question is from Colin W. from Sudbury. And he writes, I'm hearing anecdotal evidence of people contracting the virus who were seemingly very careful. They only went out for groceries. They, made six, uh, they maintained six feet of separation. And now I'm paranoid that I or my loved ones will contract the virus despite our best efforts. What's your advice on how to not live in fear while still being cautious and attentive to the guidelines? Thank you so much for that question. And uh, also thank you so much for maintaining your six feet of separation and staying at home because that is really what's going to help us in this situation. So my best advice is to stay home and stay healthy so as uh, most people have heard, there are some key factors to preventing the spread of the virus, and that doesn't mean 100%, but um, it certainly um, helps us uh, keep our families and ourselves healthy. So that social distance, um, and that includes if you need to go to a doctor's office, for example, try calling first and see if they can provide you service or, over the phone. A lot of um, places are doing that now. And also washing your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds or using hand sanitizer. Um, be very careful about covering your cough or sneeze. So um, making sure that your elbow um, blocks that cough or sneeze from spreading further in the room. Or use a tissue that can cover your face and then throw it away. Um, the other thing that I think is extremely hard to do, they actually have done studies on this, is to avoid touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. So that is the way that germs get into your body, um, besides just coming through the air if someone's coughing or sneezing. So 
wash your hands and then be very careful. I know it's very hard. Every time I want to go towards my face, I think, oh, I should, you know, bring that hand down and stop touching my face. So um, I think they do some studies where people do it 20 times an hour. So I know it's hard to do, but that's a big one. Um, you can also sanitize the high touch surfaces like doorknobs and faucets and things like that. Um, and also if you're, if you're still going to um, any type of workplace, if you're a healthcare provider or other essential person to um, make sure uh, the doorknobs and faucets are being cleaned. Um, so a lot of these measures are not comfortable. I mean, personally for myself, I'm a hugger and it can feel very awkward to not be able to greet people the way I normally would. Um, but these are so important to the health and safety of our community in times like this. Um, the other things that I would really recommend uh, to keep yourself as healthy as possible is to get adequate sleep. And that means around eight or nine hours a night. Um, doing some exercise regularly and making sure you're eating healthfully. Um, so it, I know these are recommendations that are easy to say and not as easy to do. But this might be a good time to redouble your efforts towards healthy habits because your immune system really depends on that adequate sleep and um, it can be in the best shape possible to weather the storm if we're eating well, exercising, and getting adequate sleep. Thanks so much for the question. Thank you. Um, the, uh, you can't hear those recommendations enough, I'll tell you, especially when you have a five-year-old. I can't believe how many times I ask for her to please keep her, her fingers away from her eyes, her ears, <laughs> her nose, and mouth. Um, this next question is for you, Dr. Dixon. Uh, if you could take it from uh, Lori W. from Drake It. She just basically wants to know, what is the current procedure uh, if you think you have symptoms. What what should uh, what should people like Lori do? It's an uh, excellent common question. So, if you have a fever and a cough, uh, a runny nose, and to a lesser extent a sore throat, and feel very tired, there's a chance you have a coronavirus. The vast majority of people that have coronavirus are going to have uh, four or five days of symptoms, and then they're going to feel better. And that's the natural course of the disease. Some will go on and become sicker. The only people that need to be tested now to know for certain if they have the virus, because there is no treatment, is healthcare workers, uh, including those that are in EMS, fire, first responders, anyone working in a nursing home, or anybody that is on dialysis, because if you're going into a dialysis uh, center. That includes people that work uh, in skilled nursing facilities and rehabilitation facilities as well. We have to know if you have coronavirus because we really need to keep you out of work um, so that you don't infect anyone else. In fact, if you have those symptoms, regardless if you have coronavirus, you should not be going to work until you're at least three days symptom free. So most people that want to get tested for coronavirus, we don't test them because we have to save that testing capability for the sickest patients and the healthcare workers where we really need to know if they have the virus, not to treat it, but instead to prevent the spread of the infection. Um, segregate yourself from the family, um, drink lots of fluids, and in general, even if you have it, in three to five days, you're gonna be feeling a whole lot better. Now, sometimes the disease progresses into a lower respiratory tract infection, that's a pneumonia, and you start to have symptoms of shortness of breath, and your oxygen level uh, going low is the cause of that shortness of breath. You may also have a low blood pressure from it and start to feel lightheaded with standing, not just a little bit, but persistently, not just shortness of breath with coughing, because we all experience that, but if you walk up a flight of stairs and you find yourself breathing heavy, that's a sign that you need to be seen in the emergency department and checked for a lower respiratory tract infection. And if you have that, any low oxygen level, any low blood pressure, we will then test you for coronavirus because we're likely going to admit you to the hospital and we have to make sure you're segregated into an area so we can't spread the infection. In some instances, and it's relatively rare, the disease progresses and people end up in the intensive care unit requiring uh, mechanical ventilation. And as scared as everybody is about that, 
it's a very small population of those that are infected, especially the elderly infected that are that uh, progress to that point in the disease. So what I would say is if you're young, healthy, and are not a healthcare worker in some way, um, stay home, segregate yourself, drink lots of fluids, you're going to be better in three to five days. And don't go back to work until you're three days symptom free, regardless of what the cause of the infection is. Great. Great advice. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bob, our next small business question comes from John S. And he asks, as a small business owner who recently had to lay off 135 employees due to restrictions surrounding COVID-19, what are the best options for me to consider regarding SBA emergency funding? Uh Thank you, John, for that question. Uh, when we hear of a business having to lay off hundreds of employees, it speaks to the seriousness of this current disaster. And, uh, you know, it was announced uh, earlier today that unemployment claims soared to 3.3 million last week. It really is an unprecedented uh, situation. It, but what we're encouraging all small businesses that have suffered economic injury um, that they apply for SBA's uh, economic injury disaster loan. What small businesses and private nonprofits should know is that there's no cost to apply for the SBA loan. There's no requirement that you close on the loan uh, if it gets approved. Uh, if you do close on the loan and it gets funded and uh, a better alternative and option for you comes down the road, uh, you can pay off the SBA economic injury loan with no penalty. There's no penalty at any time. So again, uh, there's going to be new tools in the toolbox for SBA to help small businesses through the stimulus bill. I would encourage uh, everyone to stay connected with the SBA through our email updates and uh, to work with us. But as far as being able to demonstrate economic injury, there's no mathematical formula. Uh, if you have a reduction in revenues and sales, or even if you're projecting because of closures that you're going to have economic injury, we suggest that you apply for this uh, economic injury loan and to get your application in the queue. It is uh, right. processed on a first-come, first-served basis, and since Massachusetts got its declaration, the entire 50 states now have declarations, and everyone is in the process of trying to apply for these. Thank you. Bob, I have a, just a follow-up on that. How quickly do you imagine the SBA will be able to stand up the bill's new small business resources, like the Paycheck Protection Program? I mean, is it too early for small businesses to begin reaching out to you? And we've been hearing uh, from a number of small businesses uh, uh, about this issue from our office, I mean, including a bookstore uh, that I've long uh, gone to uh, in Andover. And we're just wondering what they can do as they uh, anticipate you uh, standing up these new resources that are coming in. Congresswoman, this is going to be a huge priority for the SBA to stand up this program and to, um, uh, to deliver uh, for the small business community across the entire country. Uh, we've been getting calls, um, you know, asking, how do I apply for this? Uh, lenders saying, how do we do this? What do we do? Uh, it really is uh, very early because the bill hasn't been fully approved and signed off by the president. But trust that uh, this is going to be a priority for everyone within the SBA. Uh, as I mentioned, we're working uh, extended hours, working weekends. Uh, you know, once this gets approved, we get uh, talking points and, and uh, messaging. Is you know we're going to be on the road uh, communicating with the community uh, with the most current guidance in order to help them to make decisions and uh, hopefully to get access uh, to the capital that they need. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to take this question. It's from uh, Mary Ann B. Uh, she asks, what are you doing to help hospital workers who need child care in order to keep uh, working during the crisis? And will Massachusetts enable workers to find professional child care workers and subsidize that care? Uh, so, Mary Ann, my, my mom raised us, my three sisters and me, uh, while while working in childcare. Today, I'm I'm raising two young girls, ages five and seven. 
So as a daughter of a child care provider and uh, a working mom myself, it's plainly obvious to me that America's child care crisis is an economic crisis. COVID-19 has exposed our nation to this uh, problem in ways that have really uh, um, stressed our system. We have parents who can't stay home to watch their kids because they're on the front lines of this pandemic, uh, caring for patients in hospitals and community health centers, assisting customers at grocery stores or, or running small businesses to stay afloat. On March 18, the governor issued an emergency order requiring all early education centers and child care providers to close. But in lieu of these closures, the state created exempt emergency child care programs to provide child care with priority given to families of emergency personnel, medical staff, and others playing a critical role in confronting the coronavirus. These will be the only child care programs operating during the COVID-19 outbreak in Massachusetts. And during this time, subsidies from the state can be used for payroll. In addition to frontline health care personnel, families of essential employees, like your neighborhood, neighborhood uh, grocery store clerk, your gas station employee, they will also have access to these child care centers. Uh, furthermore, priority will be given to vulnerable populations and communities. My staff and I have advocated for these uh, child care centers to be opened in places like Lawrence, Lowell, Haverhill, Marlboro, and Fitchburg. It's plain as day uh, that investing in child care is central to our nation's economic health and stability. And for far too long, the child care sector has been starved of the public funds, resulting in both providers and families operating on the margins. So as we advance this package and the legislation that follows, Congress must act swiftly to provide robust federal funding for local providers, our child care workers, and our centers so that our families and economy can remain whole. Okay, we are, we this hour goes by so quickly. Um, I think we have a, 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 a time for another quick round of, of questions. I'm going to start uh, with Dr. Kelly as the Chief Medical Officer for one of the state's leading community health centers. Um, please take this important question from Sheila O. and Methuen. What financial measures are being put in place to support community health centers in this critical work? Uh, thank you so much for that question, for caring about community health centers. Um, so prior to the changes uh, with coronavirus, we were not able to do those phone or video enabled visits I was talking about. So that's been huge for us and it just changed last week so that we can now continue to see our patients virtually and still um, be paid as if we were seeing them in person. So this allows us to continue our vital functions um, now by switching over to these virtual visits. Um, there are also a number of funding packages and I know Congresswoman Trahan's doing um, tireless work to support us um, in trying to weather this storm together. Um, at the moment, with the current losses that community health centers are experiencing, um, it's estimated that uh, they'll run out of funding in about 37 days. Um, and I've been speaking to a lot of other chief medical officers at community health centers across Massachusetts, and a lot of the discussion is around how to keep their doors open and what to do with employees, such as putting them, putting them on furlough. So it's definitely a scary time um, from, for our community health centers um, who really are on a mission to remain the backbone of basic health care for our communities. I certainly appreciate the question, though, and all the support that we continue to receive from Congresswoman Trahan as we work through these uncharted waters. So there's definitely some positive there. Great. Um, Bob, this one is for you. Gary S. from Hudson wants to know, how do self-employed small business taxpayers impact, along with event and entertainment service businesses, musicians, artists, 1099ers, and gig economy taxpayers get some financial relief? Okay. Uh, thank you, Gary, for that question. So uh, sole proprietorships are certainly eligible for the uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. There's actually a separate application for sole proprietorships on our disaster uh, portal. It's Form 5C. All other forms of uh, business uh, entities are uh, through Form 5. But uh, when you think of uh, 
uh, a sole proprietorship. It's important to note that uh, SBA is going to be looking to see that income and expenses are being reported on the personal tax return with the Schedule C. Uh, businesses that are 1099s uh, would certainly be eligible uh, if they're reporting the income through the Schedule C. Uh, it, but it's important important to know that the applicant uh, cannot be a hobby. It re really needs to be a small business. And it comes down to uh, if they have a business and are filing tax returns as a business owner on a Schedule C uh, or other uh, tax form, we consider them uh, to be eligible and we encourage them to apply. Terrific. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, so, Dr. Dixon, this is a broad question, and you might have already touched on it, but Sherry H. from Lowell asks, what is being done to support our hospitals? Well, the, the easy answer is from the executive branch of the federal government, not enough, and uh, not enough fast enough. And the executive branch exists to be able to act quickly without the passing of new laws. And uh, there was a strategic reserve of PPE, that critical equipment that we need, to protect our patients and our people, and it just has not arrived. And we're a month into this. And so, um, you know, that's, that's very concerning. And hopefully now um, the federal government is, is at the executive branch is, is starting to take some action. And we just saw the first uh, bolus of equipment come to the state. And now that will be divided up amongst the hospitals that need it most. And because you're from Lowell, I have to say Jody White, the CEO of Circle Health and Lawrence and Lowell General Hospital, um, is also the chairman of the board for the Mass Hospital Association, and he's been a tireless advocate for your region and your hospitals and others to try to get that um, uh, equipment distributed out to the hospitals. I think what one of the most amazing things that has occurred for us in our hospitals is that the community has has come together and the businesses, and, the, and the, the only outside help we've been getting today, really, with equipment and our needs has been from businesses donating masks and face shields and, um, and, and in some situations, uh, dollars to help uh, the organization get through this. The, uh, we have pallet loads of things that have been donated by construction companies who use N95 masks during installation uh, uh, procedures and other things. So, you know, been incredibly touched by how the community locally has come together to support its hospitals um, and have had the opposite reaction in terms of the federal government's response. Now, thankfully, with um, Congresswoman Trahan and Congressman McGovern and Congressman Neal have really um, led a charge to have to get these bills through which will get some support to hospitals. And I, I just thank the stars every day that, uh, that we have the, the, the right party in control of the House right now, because I'm not sure where this would be, this legislation would be if we didn't. It, uh, everything you say uh, about what we're seeing on the, on the community level is, um, it's really unbelievable. We've heard so many stories, uh, but, you know, Wynn Brown uh, from Hayward Hospital was recently talk, uh, telling us about how, um, you know, a, a, an auto mechanic, a local auto mechanic came down with, you know, a few masks that he had just to donate them to the hospital. Uh, so um, it is touching uh, what folks are doing uh, at, at the ground and community level. Uh, I'm going to take this last question from Jorge. Um, he asks, uh, direct economic assistance should be provided to each American adult. What steps are being taken to provide households with direct economic assistance? So, Jorge, I don't need to convince anyone that working families, they are the biggest brunt of this economic downturn. They live paycheck to paycheck with no source of passive income, often without rainy day funds or savings to fall back on. I know this intimately well. I, I grew up in a family just like it. Last Wednesday, the president signed Congress's second stimulus package, which supports low-income and working families. It included new federal funding, such as a billion dollars to social safety net programs like SNAP and WIC. But as this pandemic grows, these families are still stuck in a precarious economic position. And it's imperative that 
phase three provides direct immediate support, such as direct payments to low and middle income families, greater social safety net benefits, suspension of loan repayments, enhanced tax, uh, tax credits and healthcare benefits, housing assistance, and so much more. The package that Congress is currently considering provides $1,200 in direct aid per adult, as well as $500 per child in households. That aid, called a recovery rebate, is maintained at full value for individuals earning up to $75,000 or $150,000 for couples. Then the recovery rebate is incrementally reduced until it phases out for those earning more than $99,000. There's there's no time to waste. We must put money directly into the pockets of individuals and, uh, and families. So I think, I think that's all the time that we have uh, for tonight. Uh, this, these go by so quickly. Um, I'd like to once again thank uh, Dr. Zondra Kelly, uh, Mr. Bob Nelson, and Dr. Eric Dixon for sharing so much vital information with us. And I want to thank everyone who dialed in uh, for an easy way to stay updated on the federal and state response, as well as information on future Teletown Halls. Please follow me on social media at Rep. Lori Trahan. Um, and if there's any advice I can impart on you, it's that we all have a role to play. And I think Dr. Kelly explained it better than I could, but it's worth repeating that staying home and keeping your distance from others go a long way to preventing the spread of coronavirus. Coughing and sneezing into your sleeve, frequently washing your hands and sanitizing surfaces, it can't be overstated. I wanna thank you all for tuning in tonight. May you stay healthy and safe. Good night.